All right, so I'd like to um, give you a little bit of background as how I wound up here. I have to continually apologize to my former students as I sink further and further into planar kinematics. You know, started with the 19, you know, the uh, 1990s, and now I'm right back to the 1960s, and there for a while, and I might even, who knows, I might wind up in the 1800s at the rate I'm going. But there, there is, there's good reason for it, and I'm going to try to explain it today. Uh, this is sort of an, this is what's come out of the whole thing. So I wound up writing all of this stuff down so I could remember it, and put it into this book. And in order to keep it to move it fast and to keep it easy. I actually, this is a self-published activity. So this is an Amazon, I have to pay for it. In fact, I can only buy 10 at a time. I guess that's the way Amazon does it. They print it on demand, and it's really kind of an interesting experience. So uh, I thought I'd bring some of them as, um, I don't know how, as gifts to whoever wants to, want, whoever, I know, I know, whoever, Commits to teaching this course. How's that? All right. So let me let me tell you where I'm going. All right. When I was in graduate school, this is the book we used: uh, Kinematic Synthesis of Linkage by Hardenberg and Denevit. Exactly the Hardenberg and Denevit who you know of from the uh, Denevit Hardenberg Convention for uh, Robotic Systems. In fact, they they were doing kinematic synthesis of spatial mechanisms in the last chapter of this book, using. Uh, the tradition, what, what we now think of as the Denver Hartenberg matrix. So this was 1964. This is the uh, table of contents, and it's basically the layout for kinematic synthesis courses from this time forward, from 1964 until, in fact, uh, I was just at Stanford. I taught Bernie Roth's course in kinematic synthesis, and this is his uh, syllabus. And all I did was kind of copy it over and, and recreate it in order to teach that course. Now, the reason why I was at Stanford was because Bernie, who has been very active in project-based learning in the Design Institute, uh, said, you know, I, Mike, I've been teaching the uh, um, kinematic synthesis course uh, for many, many years. And because I'm so involved in project-based learning, I really want to do the kinematic synthesis course in a project-based format. Maybe he's, you're the guy that seems to be doing the most with this kind of stuff. Could you give me some advice? Okay, well, I, I mean, it's an interesting thing. As old as I am, to have my dissertation advisor ask me for advice on how to teach the course that got me started in this whole business. I, I had to take it seriously. I really did. So I stepped back and I looked at what all of my notes, I gathered up everything, and I realized that I failed miserably. I tried, I continually tried to teach a project-based learning approach to kinematic synthesis, and I failed. And so when I, when I finally decided, or at least what I thought, I thought the core of the problem was, is the mathematical formulation. You need to do such complicated math just to get to the point that you could do synthesis that you know you wind up getting lost. You doing all of these loop equations, then you're doing curvature theory, you're doing all these calculations, and then what you get is an algorithm, and then you, you plug the algorithm and you try to get a solution and it doesn't work. And the end of the story, then you have to stand up there and you say, well, it, it works if you kind of do it over and over again, and it, it, it doesn't make doesn't get you very far. So I actually had, so I decided to use Mathematica. So this is what you see. What the, the red lines that you see are when I showed up at the course and I sat down with the students and I started working through what I thought was a way to do project-based learning. I was going to focus it on Mathematica. We were going to, I was going to give them little snippets of code. I was going to have them complete it. I was going to have them then generate the graphics uh, for outcome for the, uh, uh, you know, the graphic versions for the, for the curves, for the synthesis curves, and to simulate linkages. I was going to do all of that. And I, wanted, I got basically, I got basically through the first three weeks, and it just collapsed under its own weight. I just wasn't getting anywhere. And I, I made, and one of the things I did is I, Andres, um, 
one of the one of the things that I was agonizing over is that there's this simple piece of software <clears throat> called GeoGebra that frankly I got into the habit of using just to sort of sketch out designs. And I wanted to show them how some of these things work, and so I got brought up GeoGebra and I started showing them how to do it. And it turned out that was the first time, oh my gosh, that I actually got a response from the students that was somewhat positive. You know what I mean? That, you know, the students at Stanford are really energetic and they're really hardworking and they'll grind through whatever you tell them to do. But, you know, I could tell that I wasn't, it wasn't happening the way I wanted it to. And this is where I got some response. So what I wound up doing is changing everything and centering it on uh, GeoGebra and create, having them create uh, their, their uh, models in GeoGebra and simulate them and then have them tra uh, take the dimensions they would get in GeoGebra and convert them to SolidWorks. They, of course, all knew SolidWorks and they were all very good at it. And so we would generate animations of what they did. And that turned out to succeed. And I, so I wound up having to juggle things around here, but once I was done, I was then able to revive uh, this whole area of curvature theory, which is in generally, generally in the way these courses go, get lost completely. You can't figure out how to do it. Anyway, so that was the foundation of this whole thing, and it was really built on these, the backs of these students at Stanford who really put up with me as I was fighting my way through how to get to some of these ideas. All right, now, before I go on, the, the key to this whole thing, and, well, I'll get, I'll get into it, but maybe I should tell you what GeoGebra is first. So GeoGebra is a project that came out of um, Austria. It was this, uh, Marcus Hohenwarter sort of was doing this as a master's project. Then he went to Florida Atlantic, University of Florida. He's now at Johannes Kepler University in Linz. And uh, it's grown, it's grown to be huge. It was really sort of targeted to high school students originally because it's an interactive graphics. It helps you teach geometry, helps you teach the sort of basic theorems of geometry and help you do, and what it really helps you do is geometric constructions that we used to do on a, dra on a drafting. Okay, that of course, all drafting boards are gone. We have geometric modeling. We've got all that kind of stuff that sort of does does uh, geometric um, constructions in sketch mode. And in fact, uh, quite a number of our colleagues have discovered that the sketch mode, the constraint solvers in the uh, sketch mode of solid modelers, are very good for doing constructions for kinematic synthesis. The problem is the investment is pretty steep. You've got to get a whole solid modeler just to get at that sketch mode uh, feature. And that turns out to be what uh, GeoGebra is. It's basically the sketch mode. Uh, it's grown, however, and because of its popularity, it has grown hugely. It has um, computer algebra portion of it. It's got a statistics portion of it. It's got a, uh, uh, a uh, spreadsheet calculation portion, of which I, none of which I touch. And not only that, it's now an international institute. And in fact, there's institutes all around the world, including, much to my surprise, a California institute. But for my purposes, or for the purposes that I use it for, I go back to the very old version. It's called Classic 5. It's the downloadable version. And, but many of the other versions are apps that you can work on your cell phone or they're connected via the internet. I like this because I'm kind of I like to have it locally so that I can save it and load it. Anyway, that's what GeoGebra is. So when I looked at what my experience was with the students at Stanford, and I go, all right, let me just commit to GeoGebra, which was fairly. Uh, they basically pushed me in that direction. I go, well, what were the projects that I gave them that generated the most excitement? Every any time I talked about a walking machine their eyes lit up. So I wound up having to try to take all of my synthesis projects and turn them into walking machine projects in one form or another. And then, so what I did is I just went back and just said, well, let me see what happens when I look at walking machines. And it's kind of amazing. I mean, these things go way back in patents, into the patent literature. And you can, um, you, you know, you can just see all of the, your favorite mechanisms. Let me see if I can get this to work. All right, so this is an inverted slider crank. 
And now the animation you see is generated with GeoGebra. It's just kind of simple stuff. All right, and then here's, here's a, another um, walking machine. It's just a crank rocker. You know, the rocker just goes back and forth, scoots along the ground because it's got a, it's got a little one-way clutch in the foot. All right, and then here is um, a nice little walking machine. Uh, and what it is, what you see here for the first time, what, well, no, it actually in these two cases, is you see coupler curves. Now the whole point of you know a lot of what um, Denim and Hartenberg spent at the time explaining how to do curvature theory and all of this is so that you can generate coupler curves that you are interested in. Now the coupler curves, oftentimes you say, well, the coupler, you know, of course I need a coupler curve. I'm going to design a profile <coughs> linkage so that the uh, point of the coupler moves in some particular way. One of the problems that we always had in a project-based approach is, well, how do you want it to move? Well, I kind of want it to be here, 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 and here. But why? What is the system doing? And that, you know, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm picking up a soda pop bottle and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna move it from here to here. Or maybe I'm picking up a part from a, you know, some sort of pick and place movement. And it, it, it just doesn't feel natural. But in the context of a walking machine, it's incredibly natural. It's exactly the foot trajectory that you, it's the steps you want to take. And I was amazed to find this particular document, Joseph Shigley, the Shigley who at least I grew up with in terms of mechanical design, was involved in 1960 in the design of walking machines. And this is sort of the standard foot trajectory that we think about for walking machines. Now, I, I haven't been involved in, in robotics uh, walking machines. I, I, I'm sort of backing into it from the mechanism side. But you have to decide how you want the foot to move. And all of the robotics papers that I've been able to find on foot trajectories all sort of take this, maybe a symmetrical version of this. You know, and the idea is, is during contact with the ground, it's a straight line. Now why is that? Like, because you don't want the, uh, unlike, unlike people, when we walk, we actually lift our bodies up and down, uh, and our brains adapt for that. But for our walking machines, we prefer not to have to do that, so we want our walking machines to move smoothly, on, at least on smooth ground. So that's sort of the basic idea. Well, this is a straight line mechanism. Then you go, oh, well, straight line mechanisms are cool in robotics, I mean, in, in mechanical design. So this is an opportunity to explain coupler curves, talk about straight line mechanisms. And then all of a sudden you, you start looking at it. This is from Norton. This is a, a visual classification of coupler curves. But then you realize, well, the ones that we want are the ones that sort of have these straighter portions to them. So the question is, well, how do I find those coupler curves in a four bar linkage? And you can even go further. There's a nice PhD uh, dissertation done by uh, Shea in. Uh, at University of Maryland in the mid 90s with uh, Lung Wen Tsai, where they were designed, where what they did is they took four bar linkages and then they attached what's known as a skew pantograph to it in order to move. You can see here maybe that there's a, there's a four bar linkage with a coupler curve. And by attaching a skew pantograph to it, you could scale it and rotate it and make it bigger. And that, became the, that became the key insight to this whole process but there's even more. But let me just focus on this for a minute. All right. Walking machines have been studied for a long, long time. Probably the one that I find most fascinating is by Chebyshev. So this is che the Chebyshev of Chebyshev polynomials and uh, mathematical, it's big in mathematics. Well, he also worked in the area of mechanism design. He came up with this mechanism known as the lambda mechanism. We have Chebyshev. Chebyshev's straight line mechanism is generally presented as this crossed mechanism, if you've ever seen it. It's in my book. It's in a cross form. That turns out to be one version. The version he liked was this one, which is a cognate of it. It's called a lambda mechanism. It's been studied a lot because it's got some, uh, symmetric coupler curves. He turned it into this walking machine called the planted grade mechanism. And what he did is he, because this what he did is, because this makes a straight line, he could actually put two of them together, uh, create a translating link that would move around like this. And so he actually had a, uh, a mechanism that would put a foot flat on the ground. 
as it walked. And it turns out to have very nice features as a walking machine. He, what he did, which what I thought was pretty amazing, is he turned it into a walking wheelbarrow. And if you haven't seen it, there's a website in Russia that actually has all of his original works. You can go there. Um, I, I don't remember the link to it, but it's a very nice website. All right, but this is probably where I think most of us, or most of my students have seen it. All right, this is Theo Jensen. So he's an artist in the Netherlands, and this is one of his walking machines. They are so incredibly dramatic, okay. And so uh, what this is, is this is, I, I forget, it's got, it's like the rhinoceros or something. It's like the rhinoceros version of what his strand beast is. And I'll show you his strand beast. We'll talk more about him in a little bit. Uh, over here, I just wanted to point out, this is a patent, this is a US patent that basically took um, Chebyshev's work and patented it about 50 years later in, a, in what's known as a walking work vehicle. You can see the coupler curve right here, and you can actually see the lambda mechanism, and you've got two of them to sort of create a translating piece. All right. Um, I, I just want to lay that as the foundation. So now the question is, what are we going to do today? And what I'm going to try to do for you today is walk you through my experience um, over this past uh, spring quarter. At the UCI, we have 10 week quarters, and I'm going to show you uh, the course that I taught after realizing what didn't work at Stanford, sitting down trying to figure it all out, writing this book, getting everything pulled together with the pieces that I thought would work. I then tested it at UCI, and it kind of worked. So I thought I would just give you, show you this little video. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, I post all of this stuff online so you can see it at, um, uh, you know, on my YouTube website, or YouTube channel, Mechanical Design 101. So if you've looked at any of that, I'm sorry to, that you're going to see a lot of repeats in what I'm showing you, but I'll try to explain it. So what you're actually seeing here is just the final day of class. I, because the students really put up with a whole lot in terms of trying to figure out how this would work. I had to figure out how to build these things, and they built them. They did. There, there's one of them right there. Maya has it. She can show it to you. You can take a look at it. They're all made with, with laser-cut uh, Baltic birch. I made some fundamental errors that I will exp I'll show point to you. That, that turns out to have nothing to do with the actual kinematic synthesis process, but more with the mechanical drive part of it. I'm sorry that I that just was focused on other things, but. I'm not going to make that mistake again. I'm going to try it again in the fall. But what you're seeing here is just all of the different designs. So we got, they all have the same basic kinematic structure. Uh, they, they got slight variations on the kinematic structure, but the students really came up with wildly different um, executions. Uh, let me see if maybe I can speed forward a little bit. So we actually got some of them to work. Yeah, so. I think there's another one. Yeah, so that's the, um, all right, so we'll do it next. All right, so, you know, that's sort of what I want to get to with today's talk. I want to sort of let you understand what I had to do to get to that point and how we did it. Uh, I have these basic topics, um, and I don't know how to get you to understand these without actually showing you the constructions in GeoGebra, which means I have included the videos that I actually gave the students for those constructions. Now, those videos are incredibly boring because they're just me. I, I actually put my picture in it, mainly because I thought that the students would want to know that I was really there doing these <laughs> constructions. Uh, so I've got to figure out how best it will work with you today. But I thought I would do at least the construction of a coupler curve to just sort of show you how that works. And if any of you are interested and you want to download GeoGebra and try it along with me, I will reward you. How's that? 
Okay, maybe with one of these books. Okay, <laughs> but if you don't want to do it, I perfectly understand. Okay. All right. So are you are you ready to just just sit back and watch? You don't have to do it, but just sit back and watch. All right. Okay. And now this is what's interesting about this is, you know. I thought about I've, I've thought about this probably too much, but um, a good part of teaching is is in some ways a performance, if you know what I mean. If nothing else, that it's a performance that the students follow along with and learn from copying you. So if you're writing all the equations, you're doing it, the derivations on the blackboard, they follow along and they watch you, they copy, and then they it sort of somehow processes and processes and they get some understanding. When you're doing project-based learning, you're you're kind of disrupting that. The students don't have the opportunity to follow you. You so the question is, how does that work? And I didn't know this, but it, it turns out these videos work uh, enormously, work very well. Because what what happened is that this is the way it works. So I was uh, probably I was teaching a class once a week for three hours, and I would just you know, do it at a very leisurely pace. And I would so about the second week, or maybe it was even the third week of class, the students finally stepped up. They kind of rebelled, and they said, "Professor." You're giving us enough time to follow you, and we appreciate that. But it would be a whole lot easier if you would just make videos. Okay, <laughs> and they asked me, I go, okay, if you insist. Um, but let me just do a four bar linkage. Okay, so four bar, the way we do a four bar linkage is you specify four points. Now, and then a coupler curve. I mean, a point to do the coupler curve. Now, you'll notice I got rid of the I got rid of the coordinates and I got rid of the background and I don't even I don't even like these labels so I get rid of all of this stuff. There's you can go in here and you can just get rid of it. Um, I don't know why I don't like it, but it just this was when you start getting a lot of stuff on the screen, I find it distracting. But what's nice here is it keeps track of all of the information over to the side. Now I do need a an axis, so I just type in y equals zero here, and it gives me the line. Uh, but in order to sort of keep things um, simple, I like to change the color of it. I, I prefer that it not be so black. Okay, so I'm going to change it to gray. I don't want labels. No new, no new object. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I get rid of these labels. Now, um, you know, I specified my four bar, the dimensions of my four bar linkage over here, but it's kind of not a good idea, I've discovered, to actually build the four bar linkage here. It's really better to start and just build it over here. Um, and now I can measure, this is your standard compass. If you remember compass and straight edge constructions, you know, so I can, I'm going to consider this the, um, the base link. So I just put a circle in there. I don't, again, I changed the color. I got in the habit of changing the colors just so that I could organize my thinking. Uh, and so I'm now going to intersect, I'm now going to intersect the two. So I have this circle intersecting with this line. And this now becomes the base of my four bar linkage. You know, but if you're building a walking machine, the chances that the base of your four bar linkage, whatever you choose it to be, really is oriented the way you want it is essentially zero. So it, it's helpful, or at least it is helpful for me, to, uh, to sort of introduce the ability to rotate the base of the four bar linkage. And that's kind of easy to do, but uh, it requires that you create a variable. So the way uh, uh, GeoGebra introduces variables is uh, with what they call sliders. So I now have this angle, and I can sort of change it to whatever I want it to be, and I'm going to copy it here. And what what that means now is I'm going to have the base of my robot of my four-bar linkage 
but it's going to be, oops, this but it's, okay, I'm going to be able to specify it as this angle. All right, and so now I put a segment in. This will be the base of my four bar. And now I can sort of rotate it however I want. Okay, I'll put it here just for convenience. All right, so let's now build this here. The four bar linkage is sitting here, so let's just build the pieces of it. And if you think about how you do it, I mean, uh, well, okay. When I try to introduce a four bar linkage to my students in the very first situation, I actually show it in terms of the intersections of circles. And one of the main reasons I do that is so that they can see visually that when you have a four bar linkage, there's actually two solutions to the input output problem. All right, so let me, here's my input crank. We'll put it here. Here's my output crank. We'll put it there. But now I have to introduce an angle that specifies the rotation of the input. So just like I created an angle um, uh, relative to this line to, for the base of my uh, four bar linkage, I'm going to create an angle for the input. And it's going to be, I'm going to measure it relative to the base of the uh, linkage. All right, so got to I have to introduce another slider. All right, so it's going to be gamma. And it's going to sit here, so I can be able to change this. And so I specify the angle from here to here. And I have to call it gamma. Now what you're seeing is that it's kind of, it's relatively easy for me to sort of explain what I'm doing, but there's a lot of tiny little steps in it here. And this is where the students started, you know, saying, well wait, how did you change the color? How did you, you know, select that point? And, and this type of thing. And this is why I was pushed to do the videos. All right, so I, it, just to coordinate things for myself, I got to, I have to change colors, and I have to make this thicker, so this kind of stuff, so I can see it. All right, now I have my moving crank, and I can actually move the entire linkage however I want. So let's now introduce the coupler link. So we measure it from here to here, and we stick it right on the end of the uh, crank. Now there's so many circles, I don't know. I just can't, I can't cope, all right? So I start getting rid of the circles that I don't want. Oh, that one I want. This one, I want that one. What about these other two? No, 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 I don't want that. All right, so I start hiding things I don't want to see. I don't even want to see these angles. Okay, oops, I want that one, but I don't want this one. All right, good. In fact, I don't even like this point here. I'm gonna get rid of that point. All right, um, so now I can see that my input, my coupler is going to connect, intersect either here or here. So let's let's make that intersection. So it'll be with this and that. I don't know what happened. Why all these guys came back? Let me get rid of them. Oops. And if you watch my videos, you'll see that it has all of these my little mistakes all along the line. Okay, so here's the coupler. It goes to there, and then here's the output link. All right, I like to color these things. It just keeps it sorted out in my mind. All right, undo. Got too many things going on. All right, select this one. I'm going to make it blue. All right, now I'm basically done with the four bar linkage, but it's kind of no fun unless I have a coupler curve. But let me just show you now what we can do. So over here, I can select, cancel, I want this, select that, and I want this little gear in the upper right hand corner, and now I can turn the animation on. So what it does is it takes this variable and it turns it on. And so it's now, ro it's now rotating and following the link. I don't want it to rock back and forth, so let me change that. So 
is wider. I want. I don't want it to oscillate. Let's just increase. Continue. All right. So now it's going to rotate around. Oh, here's a point I don't want. Let's get rid of this thing. All right. But now what you can see is that um, I'm going to even get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. Why? Why the animation disappears at some point? Well, you know the reason as well as I do. All I have to do is change this. See? Now, it seems that probably the nicest thing about all of this is that I can change the dimensions. And so by making the input crank really small, I get a, rota I get a full rotation. If I make the input line kind of big, it fades away on me. Okay, so that kind of a nice feature for me here in this kind. All right? But the, and so now, and, and I can change the dimensions. And that's also why I like to put the, the link, you know, the, the model linkage over to the side so that it doesn't distract from what I'm the changes I'm making. Now, what I'm still missing here is I don't have a coupler curve. So if you're patient with me, just one last little bit, I'm going to show you how to add the coupler curve. Now, the interesting thing about uh, adding a coupler curve, or at least is the, the initial thought that I had, is that I have these dimensions. Let me just put it in. Here's going to be my coupler link. And I have these dimensions. I have a dimension on one side and a dimension on the other side. And so why don't I, why don't I just do the same thing I was doing here, use circles to position that coupler point. The problem with that is, is that um, that tells GeoGebra that it, that point is defined by the intersection of circles. And it is really easy when you start moving dimensions all around for it to choose the wrong intersection and in trying to help you out. Since it's a linear, I mean, what you want is just the intersection of two lines. It's actually better and it's more uh, reliable if you just generate the two lines. So what you do is you measure these angles. You measure this angle here. All right, which is uh, epsilon, and then you copy it here. All right, that's epsilon. All right, so that gives me a line. Did I not do it right? Let's try it again. All right. Epsilon, yeah. Okay, there it is. All right, then that, that you, gives you a line that defines one side of this coupler curve. Now I just measure the other side. A lot of little steps here, but they're, oops, cancel. I have to have the right, the right menu element. Measure this angle. Okay, that's now eta. So let's go back here. And we measure from here to here. And we'll put eta in there. All right, we'll draw that line. And where these two intersect is now the cover curve. I mean, is the copper point. All right, now let's get rid of this stuff and get rid of the lines. I don't want to see it. Put this copper, the copper link in here. Get rid of all this stuff. I don't want any of that. Get rid of this point. Get rid of this point. Now this is the point I care about, so I'm going to make it a bright color, and I'm going to make it big. Uh, I believe you choose the wrong point. Uh, is that the wrong point? Yeah, I believe so. Oh no, oh, I... It doesn't look the same in the general. It doesn't look this, it doesn't look yeah. this. Well, I don't know what I've done. Let me, let me rotate it back. Uh, that looks pretty close. No? I don't know. Okay, let me rotate it. Let me rotate it to about an angle that it's there. How's that? 
That's pretty close. Can you measure the lengths? The lengths? I can measure the lengths, yeah. <coughs> All right. Distance. We'll measure the distance from here to here. And it's 2.7. We'll measure the distance from here to here. 2.7. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> You're a tough crowd. All right. Now here's a little trick that just is just blows my mind. Okay. So I can select this locus function, and I select this point and this uh, uh, operation, and it draws the coupler curve. All right. So. And now what you see is that I can. I can actually now say that that is the, that is the, oh, sorry, I want to change this. That, that is the curve that I want to use as a foot trajectory. And now I've designed, I've designed a, a four bar linkage for a walking machine. So that's my four bar linkage for a walking machine. And if I don't, don't like that coupler curve, I can sort of move it around and try to find other coupler curves. I keep forgetting to select the selection tool. Let's keep running this. All right, let's look at other coupler, let's look at other coupler curves. Maybe that one, maybe that's a better one. See what I mean? So uh, that, this is what, when I, when I stumbled on this with the students at Stanford, they just loved it. Right. Now, this isn't any good in terms of actually building something. So in order to actually turn it into a physical uh, walking machine, we actually had to uh, take the dimensions of this mechanism and, and make a solid works model. Okay, so this is, what you see here is the, the heart of everything uh, that comes, comes to this point. All right. Done. Done with my GeoGebra demonstration. But let me ask you something. Sure. It shouldn't be that perhaps the copper, the copper curve should be upside down? Correct. Correct. Let me go back. Look at all these copper curves in the uh, patent literature. Right? Let's look at them. Right? Upside down. Right? And let's look at this one. Well, you can't. No, you look at this one. They they barely got it flat. They did get it flat. Okay. So getting a coupler curve the shape you want is the entire question, right? And not only that, once you get the shape you want, how do you position it the way you want? The answer to the first question is curvature theory. The answer to the second question is the skew part is the skew pentagram. Alright? So let's get let's get let's let me go there. There's construction of four-bar linkage. Curvature theory. Okay, now the curvature theory is was an was, let's put it this way, was an area of kinematics that was very important uh, when I was <coughs> in school. Rico and I and, and Pennock and I mean look, there's a lot, we were all doing curvature theory in those days. Dellen Wang at um, at Dalian. Um, there's just a, a lot of us trying to figure out uh, curvature theory in three-dimensional space so to, because we were sure that it was going to be as valuable in robotics and in spatial kinematics as it was in the plane. Curvature theory is basically gone. I mean, you can't, you type, you try to do uh, any kind of search on curvature theory. And there's, uh, there's a group in uh, Turkey that's doing a great job and they're actually extending it in a bunch of different geometries. But it's not something that we're seeing uh, used as a regular basis. It, what it does, what curvature theory does, is it's, an, and it's incredible. Uh, Adam, and I, I don't have anything to see. Uh, let's see this picture. The basic idea here is that uh, if, if you have a four bar linkage, 
you can position that four bar linkage in one instant. And from that, you can determine uh, some geometric properties. The number first thing you can determine is what's known as the canonical coordinate system. Where does it lie? It lies at the velocity pole at that instant. How is it oriented? It's oriented so the x-axis is tangent to what's known as the centrum, okay, the moving centrum. All right. Once you've got that, and that's easy to define, and it's, there's actually graphical constructions that help you make it really easily. Once you've got that, you can construct this circle. This circle is known as the inflection circle. And what that represents in the, in the entire body of the coupler of the four bar linkage, this is the set of points that in this configuration are at an inflection of their trajectory. And it's and what's amazing is that you can from one instant in the movement of the four bar linkage and one point where you assign geometric properties such as right here you're at you're at an inflection. What does it mean to be an inflection? It means that the trajectory coming into that point is curved in one direction and going out of that point is curved in the other direction. That means locally, that trajectory is moving on a straight line. And why do you want a straight line? Because you want it to be the, the, um, the, where the, your leg mechanism is in contact with the ground. Uh, you can even go further. You can generate what's known as the cubic of stationary curvature. I don't show you this, but you can generate the cubic of stationary curvature. There's a nice, it's a relatively simple, relatively clean graphical construction that goes in, that you can put in GeoGebra really easily. And it shows you on the inflection circle, there's this cubic of stationary curvature. And where it intersects the inflection circle, you get not only is the inflection not only is that point in inflection with zero curvature, because the curvature is not changing, it is stays a line of even a little bit longer. And when I say a little bit longer, look at this. It really dominates the shape of the curve. All right, the properties of the curve are such that if you uh, select this point, you really can get the shape of the proper curve that you want. You don't have to use those points. You can actually, there's, turns out that there can other be features over here. Maybe you don't want this, um, cusp. this cusp, you know, so you can actually choose points off it a little bit farther away. You can keep the main feature of the uh, coupler curve, but you're rid of the cusp. And you can actually move this, this four bar linkage around, move it into different configurations, and GeoGebra will adapt and show you whatever what all the different cases. So you can sort of visually explore the coupler curves associated with a, a given four bar linkage or change the four bar linkage to get the coupler curve you want. All right. Once you've got a four bar linkage with a coupler curve you want, there's three things you can do with it. What do you need? You need Am a microphone? I too quiet? Am I too quiet? Do you need one? I, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want them to hear me. You mean they've been sleeping all this time? You didn't tell me I was too quiet. <laughs> My wife will never believe you. Somebody in the back complained about that. Oh. Oh, our dear friend Andres. Andres. Oh my gosh. Yes, I will of course wear a microphone. All right. Oh, yeah. Nice. All right. Can you hear me? <laughs> Just want to make sure. Just want to make sure. All right. All right. Thank you. I happy. Actually, I, I was feeling a little bit strained, so I appreciate it. Okay. All right. So once you have, so this is, get back here, Rico. Come on. Let me put it up higher for you. Oh. So while we're adjusting mic for Professor McCarthy, I just want to tell you guys that all the slides that I've received so far are posted on the course website. So everybody knows the URL to the school, yes? Uh, so you can follow along with this presentation, the presentation is also on the website. By the way, this is my daughter's artwork. Oh yeah. <laughs> Anurag was kind yes. enough to include that. We were we actually started off with uh, 
with a um, logo that used the, the KISS, yeah, the, the band that KISS yes. as the model. But um, then we, then I don't know why, we just sort of got a little bit crazy. So, all right. There's a four bar in there. There's a, oh yeah, there it is right here. By the way, the I is this four bar Lincoln show. I'm not going anyway. I'm not starting, Rico, until you sit down. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Rico, okay. we need We can wait. We can wait. All right, I'll get started. All right, so uh, there, his, his question was, okay, let's, so the, the two pieces, if you remember, is how do I get the shape of the four bar linkage I want? The answer is curvature theory. Once I've got that shape, if it's not positioned relative to the linkage in a useful way, I, I, gotta, I have to do something. Well, there's three ways that you can reposition the coupler curve. Uh, number one is to do what Chebyshev uh, did. And actually, it turns out for any coupler point, the trajectory of any coupler point in a, for a four bar linkage, you can find a dyad that you can connect to it so that this link translates. With, with the, so that every point in this link translates with that coupler curve. And that'll allow you to position the coupler curve anywhere you want it. You can't scale it, but it'll allow you to, it, because that link is translating, every point on that link uh, follows that coupler curve, and you can just sort of extend it down to the ground and, and position it the way you want. So that's number one. Number two is to do it the way um, uh, Clan, K L A N N, uh, Joseph Clan, I think, in the. Um, late 1990s patented a six patented this six bar linkage where what he did is he took an RR link and he simply attached the coupler curve of a four bar linkage to it and what he got was you know a transformed coupler curve I've looked everywhere I've tried to figure out a simple way to identify this transformation in other words if I have a particular four bar linkage or a particular coupler curve with particular characteristics how do I use a uh, RR chain to transform it in some way that I want? I couldn't find it. And it turns out what he did is he just experimented and he got sort of an interesting shape that's very popular. So he's got a special set of geometry that, that gives him the foot trajectory he wants. That, that linkage is used in what's known as the Mondo Spider that was very popular at Burning Man in the 2000s work of art. It's a piece of art. Uh, if you look up, I think it's called Eat Art, e -A -T -A -R -T org. You'll see uh, anime, you'll see videos of that Mondo spider. All right, and that's the clan linkage. And this is a very popular one. Quite a number of, and you'll see this appear in different places. Um, and then the final one, the final version, uh, is to take the four bar linkage and add to it what's known as a skew pantograph. It turns out to be very easy to do. What you do, and I'll just describe it to you so you get that basic idea. Here is my coupler curve. All right, that's my coupler curve. I can now choose any point. It's kind of interesting. I can choose any point in the coupler. And when I choose that point, I get this line. And from that, I can now construct this parallelogram. So I have this parallelogram, and, and it's all determined by this point right here. Then what I do is I take this triangle, and I duplicate it, but I can't duplicate it exactly. What I do is I scale it so that it fits on this edge. So whatever this distance is, it gets scaled to this distance, but the angles are all the same. So this is a triangle similar to that triangle. And what that does is that scales this coupler curve and rotates it depending on how you choose this point. So if you move this point around, you know, you, if you, you can uh, change this scaling ratio and you can actually change the orientation. It's like, it's like a no-brainer. It's like incredibly simple. So that's my answer. Okay, the skew pan graph. All right. Okay, so I go to Bernie, I just want to add this little story. I go to Bernie Wild, I said, you know, this is like amazing. I didn't even know the ski pantograph exists. It turns out um, I should have known because um, Waldron used something equivalent to it in his walking machine. 
And then Roth, of course, Bernie says, oh, well, you mean you didn't see my 1965 paper on the 19th? <laughs> no, I didn't. Sorry, I'm letting you down. Okay. All right. So how to construct a skew pantograph. It's in the YouTube stuff. I'm not going to put, put you through it. But basically the idea is once you've got this four bar linkage, once you've got this um, coupler curve you want, I don't know how I found this one. It looks like it's almost a straight line with two cusps in it. All right, all you do is pick this point. Now, uh, again, what I do is I, what I did is I took a screenshot of the, um, of the curve that I got from curvature theory and I put it here put all my measurements here, put the point there so that I could move it around uh, and then just use this as the design model. So just, just as a word of advice, you have to get in the habit of doing two different uh, designs. You have a static model and an, an animated model. Okay, it just works better. Yeah. All right, then that way you can move these points around in any which way and then you can see the different designs. You'll see again, I rotate the base of the four bar linkage so that I could put the foot in the downward direction. Okay. This got me to week six of my class. All right, so I, and, and it's, everything seemed to be going fairly smoothly. What I would do is I would group the students into three person teams that I would randomly assign. Then I would give them a homework assignment that had three pieces to it. So they would work together, that way they would sort of look at the videos and they would talk each other through and they would find their, and they would sort of solve their own debug it. If there was some real problem, I would, I would help them out. Uh, I had a TA who was helping me also. And then I would randomly juggle them so that every assignment was a different uh, grouping. The nice thing about that is because I was de developing the classes I was going along and I was just really pressed for time, it meant I only had to grade one third of the number of assignments. Okay. Nice, nice, you know. And then it just, and then the students that didn't do very well or who dragged down all the other groups kind of a, kind of showed up because as they dragged down every group, they, <laughs> their grades would uh, sort of average out more at the bottom end. And the students that were carrying everyone else would average out at the top end. It seemed to work okay. Anyway, so these are the, this is our course management system. We have Canvas. I don't know if you guys have that kind of stuff. It's, it's a little awkward to use, but this is, this is week two, week three, week four, week five. I had this in class project. This is where we turned it into, uh, a, we, we, they would take the uh, designs of the linkages I showed you, they would make SolidWorks models of them, and then we actually built them. They did not attach it, any motors to this. They just built the linkage itself. And this is where I had my first major problem. All right, the linkage design was pretty cool. I mean, the linkage worked. The problem is, is that I couldn't turn a crank. Uh, brass on Baltic birch is really a pretty good bearing. It is, you cannot, uh, uh, use adhesive to attach brass to Baltic birch. It doesn't work. Any, everything we tried to do, it just wouldn't work. Gorilla glue, super glue, nothing. What you have to do is you've got to make the equivalent of a key. What is that? It? What is that? It's a little self-tapping screw that you, you know, screw into one side of the brass rod. It gives you that little piece that now you have to cut a little notch out of your um, crank and you now have the leverage to make it turn. It turns out it worked beautifully, but I didn't discover that until they all turned in their assignments and none of them worked. Okay, so, yeah. Mike, so what is a crank drive? You mean like just drive it by hand? Yeah, they would drive it by hand. Right, okay. Yeah, at least at this stage, it was just you would drive it by hand to see the legs move, right? Well, they could kind of get it, they would have to push it around because they couldn't turn the crank, you know what I mean? So. And, and, and it, so, but this is an example of what we were doing, and you sort of see what uh, Maya has back there. All right, so that worked okay. Oh, oh maybe I, so here, let me just show you. So these are all different groups. Um, so this gives you, I just walked out, I had them all, stacked them up. You'll see some are missing. You know, some groups are better than others. So that gives you, so even at our, even at the sixth week of class, we had all, 
different kinds of designs, even though they're all basically the same construction. But because they're using GeoDRA, any, any little thing they do that's unique to their uh, to their construction makes it a different makes it a different design. All right, so that's kind of what we're doing. All right. Now I was debating on t telling you about this, but I think it's important. Um, how am I doing on time? Nine thirty. I have what an hour? Uh, yeah, you have uh, it's until ten thirty. So. 10.30. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the time now talking about this piece of it. This is what I think makes it all worth the trouble, okay? Uh, and I'm going to take the time. It'll only take me about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll do our little, our little project. Things. Okay. So what I found is that uh, because we want to generate a foot trajectory, um, and with a four bar linkage, that turns out to be a coupler curve, and then you want to extend it in some way, you wind up using a skew quadrant, a skew pentagraph. These two very fundamental principles of kinematics show up in a natural way. And I thought that was pretty cool. But what I think is in some ways more important is this next step. Okay, there are two pretty well-known uh, leg mechanisms out there now, I would say, that most everybody point to. And that's the one that I showed you already, which is uh, by uh, Theo Jensen, uh, his strand beast. I showed you a different version, but it's basically the same mechanism. So this is his strand beast. I don't think there's any mechanical engineering student anywhere that has missed this. I mean, it's just like one of those things that just seems, okay, this is a good place to test. How many people have seen this before? See what I'm saying? Okay. Um, you may not be familiar with this. This is actually a hometown girl uh, from Pomona College in Southern California who did this as a project when she was an undergrad, wound up going to uh, MIT and working in their sort of uh, media uh, stuff, and she did, did great stuff there, got a, got a master's degree and does a whole bunch of stuff. I would, I would strongly urge you to look at amandagasai.com. It just shows all the really interesting things she's doing. The one that I care about is, of course, this one. Okay, so this is her walking machine. Now, it turns out that if you look, her master's thesis is online. You can design, download it and look at it. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good exploration of kinematic synthesis by someone who's never been taught kinematic synthesis. You can say the same thing. Uh, Theo Jensen did an incredibly sophisticated job of doing kinematic synthesis without knowing anything about kinematic synthesis. And really, the, this, the basic principle is they come up with some sort of general ideas and general constraints, and then they do an optimization. As, it, as it's optimizing, they sort of look at where the optimum is going, and they kind of tweak the optimum to try to get features that they identify as being important to their mechanism. And what they get is actually pretty impressive. Now, what I want you to know is that this shouldn't be a surprise. The fact that, it, that there is a very straightforward way of getting uh, of analyzing and getting the mechanisms that they have. And that's what I want to talk to you about. All right, uh, first of all, what uh, these mechanisms are, so that you understand, is they are RR chains. So it is a hip, I don't, I'm not sure you can see it, but buried in here is a hip joint and a knee joint. All right, and there are two four bar linkages. There's a four bar linkage that drives the hip joint. You can sort of imagine how that would work and it would make the hip joint swing back and forth. There's also a four bar linkage that drives the knee joint. But how does it drive the knee joint? Because it's like a way. Well, it's very simple. You attach a parallelogram linkage to the knee joint, and then you drive the input to the parallelogram linkage. So you now have two inputs at your hip, and you've got a four bar linkage that drives one input, and a four bar linkage that drives the other input. Mr. McCarthy, that's two degrees of freedom. 
Not if I couple the two inputs of the four-bar linkage. So the four bar linkage, all I have to do is take those four bar linkages, combine them into a single input. You know, the two couplers come out, one drives one input to the hip, to the hip, the other drives the input to the uh, uh, parallel diagram linkage to the knee, and that's Jensen's mechanism, and that's Gasai's mechanism. You can sort of see the uh, parallelogram linkage here. And the other part, this, some of these other parts are actually structures, so it's kind of confusing. So it's really, it's kind of, it's confusing in looking at it. But once you know that what it is, is it's a crank. There's a crank in here. Let me run it. Oops. Okay. There's a crank right here that's going around. At the end of the crank, there's two bars coming off. So that's really uh, one input, two outputs. One bar drives the hip joint, the other bar drives the uh, knee joint through a parallel ground. All right, so once you understand that, you now realize that what all I really have to do, I've got the basic structure. If I have a <coughs> leg that's moving, I simply have to define what is the rotation that I want of the hip and what is the rotation I want of the knee as a function of my input crank angle. In case you don't know, that's known as a function generator. So that what we have to do is we have to do the synthesis of a function generator. Now if you're going to do this graphically, the absolute most that you want to do is three position synthesis. It's just incredible. I'm, I'm here to tell you that, that the graphical synthesis of three position uh, of three position function generators is not difficult. In fact, that's what this one this is all about. You can actually go on uh, YouTube, and I would urge you to take a look at it. Um, I have all kinds of mistakes in this. Let me see if I can uh, play it. Uh, probably the best mistake is that I point to. You know, these two pivots, which are the ground pivots, and for some reason I call them the moving pivots. And I was going to go back and I was going to correct it, but it was a lot of work and I just decided, okay, I'm just going to take the hit. I'm going to get people all over the world who look at this and say, are those really the moving pivots? And I'll write back and say, no, they're not. It's, you know, it's my, my mistake. Uh, but what, what this is, is this is a trash can linkage. So, in other words, you have the input here where you push the pedal down. And then there's a bar that comes up and it pushes the lid up. It's your standard input-output function generator. And I teach that in the class as its own little project. And they build, a, they build a solid model of a trash can. And then the main thing that I tell them when they're done with this class is at least you know how to design a trash can. Okay, <laughs> maybe, not a, maybe not a walking machine, but you can design a trash can. The construction of this is really interesting. It's relatively straightforward, a little bit complicated, but um, you can do it. Uh, now, now, how do you design the walking machine? Well, you've got to set it up first. So the main thing, if I'm doing three position synthesis, is I need three, position, three points on a line, because that's really the main characteristic of my, uh, of my foot trajectory. OK, well, that's not very precise. Right, my 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 curve, whatever goes through, can go through two of them and curl around and come back, and they can do it all different ways. It can sort of curve up and down. And you're right, three position synthesis is a very crude approximation in terms of the design of a walking machine, but it works and it teaches you rather fundamental property of uh, of kinematic synthesis, which is three position synthesis and a function generator in the context, which is kind of amazing, of a walking machine. Once you, so what you do is you set this up, then you draw your leg mechanism. I put over here two models so that I can adjust the length and get them different lot sizes. And then what you do is you specify the input, and the, uh, these are both the input cranks. I separated them so that I can design them individually. You can then put them back together if you want, or you can simply design the, if depending on getting, you can move them around any way you want to try to get the leg mechanism you want. And then all you do is couple the inputs together. You know, you just put a belt to them or you put a gear train to see. I, we tried belts. 
and we had trouble with dogs because we couldn't get the sizes we want. Amazon just had some limits in what you could buy. Uh, Maya was able to use gears because she could actually make them. She just wrapped a prototype with the gears, and that's probably a better approach. Anyway, you've got three positions. So you can see here now that the uh, rotation around the knee is one, two, three positions. I'm sorry, the rotation around the hip is one, two, three positions. The rotation around the knee here is brought down by a uh, parallelogram that gets you view three positions here. And so I now have three, I have three input angles. I just make sure they're the same. Construct my uh, uh, function generator. And amazingly enough, it works. Right. Now, when, once you have, now you'll, you'll notice I build it upside down. And I, you don't have to build it upside down. I just for my own peace, own peace of mind, you're getting tons of stuff on the screen. It just helped me to have it upside down because then my cranks and my rockers were kind of oriented the way I'm used to seeing them. So the mechanism comes upside down. I was, you get a uh, curve that sort of looks like this, which looks pretty good. It's now pointed in the upward direction, and then you're back to the same problem we had before. I now have a coupler curve that coordinates the leg angles the way I want, but the curve itself is not positioned relative to the mechanism the way I want. There's two simple solutions. One is to build another parallelogram linkage so that you translate it and you can move it any way you want. Or, and I don't show it here, but you can attach a, a, a skew uh, parallelogram to it and then you can rotate it and translate it any, and rotate it and scale it any way you want. All right, and so that brings us to the end. Let's see what I've got. Oh, here. So this gives you an idea of how this works. So the crank is rotating here. This crank, and they rotate in, a co in combination. And then, you know, one output drives the knee joint. The other output drives the uh, hip joint. And then when you do that and you assemble it, I could actually just build a parallelogram linkage here, and then this moves in translates and so I can move the foot anywhere you want. Almost all of the, you can also do this with a skew pantograph, but most all of my students adopted this approach in terms of making the actual leg mechanism. And so here's it. So the last three weeks of the class, four weeks actually, last four weeks of the class, uh, they built their solid models and you see they came up with all kinds of different looking designs. And then they actually built them. One of the nice things about a um, laser cutter is that the machine you build actually looks like the machine you designed. Let me see if I got any animation to see what I can. These are all, all of these things are. Okay, so that's sort of, that's sort of work. The, um, the reason why I put the wheels in the back is that these are, you know, these are really complicated puzzles for these students to put together, and I just wanted to get the legs working. So we just put wheels in the back, so that, that was sort of the idea. We put the motor, you can see where the motor is, the motor sits over the set of wheels, and they, they kind of do the job. I'd say this one actually, we lifted it up off the ground so it could move smoothly. They need some tweaking, there's some real, there's some real, design issues. I mean, this, the, the kinematics works, but at some point you got to take the next step. you got to make sure that the entire system works. All right. So that's, that's it. That's my story. Let me just go through the what I feel like are the basic principles. I, see how I steal from you, uh, Mark? I just, all the time, yeah. All right. This, uh, this is Mark's work when he was at, uh, with me at at uh, UCI, and this is his work when he was at Berkeley. All right, walking, I, what the point here is I found an amazing way walking machines, of all the different types of walking machines, each in various ways provide really nice case studies for mechanism synthesis. Uh, simple walkers use coupler curves, so if you, you don't want to go any further than that, you can just do the coupler curve for a, a simple walker, and it's kind of it's a, it's a really nice uh, example. Uh, more complex walkers use function generators to drive the hip and joint angles. 
Now, um, the best you can do with a four bar linkage in terms of if you were going to use a function generator for the hip and a function generator, a four bar linkage for the hip and a four bar linkage for the knee, the best you can do is five accuracy positions. You know, so I'm going to, you, know, you just can't do any better than that. Uh, if you use a six bar function generator, you can go up to 11 accuracy positions. 